Alright, well we are back. Hope you guys had a good break. We have got a couple more speakers here before we break again for lunch. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for as many different companies as there are out there and many different ideas, there's, there are equally as many different strategies and ways to go about implementation and execution. And inside of industries, there are even more different types of ideas on strategy and how to run your business and how to execute. Uh, so our next speaker, Will Pearson, is going to give us some of his experience from starting Mental Floss Magazine, the strategy that he used, some of the rules that he broke, and what he did and did not know about his industry before we got into it. Will is considered the titan of trivia by Newsweek Magazine, which I don't know how you get that title. Like, that's pretty ambitious. Do you have to know everything? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, he launched Mental Floss Magazine in 2001. It's received rave reviews from national media including the Wall Street Journal, Entertainment Weekly, the LA Times, and the Washington Post, amongst others. He is a native of Birmingham, Alabama. Co-founded the magazine in, a, in his dorm room at Duke. Among other honors, the company has been selected as one of America's fastest growing businesses by Inc. Magazine four years in a row. Will is also named, he has been named to Inc.'s list of 30 under 30, America's coolest young entrepreneurs, which I can vouch for. Vouch for. Very cool guy. In April 2011, Mental Floss was purchased by Felix Dennis and is now a wholly owned subsidiary of The Week. So let's hear from Will Pearson now. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, thank you guys. It's good to be here. Wanted to walk through uh, what Mental Floss is all about and tell you a little bit about the story. One of the things that I'll be focusing on here is uh, the fact that we were incredibly naive going into uh, producing a magazine as one would be trying to create a magazine, uh, getting into the print publishing industry. But wanted to illustrate that very early on. The idea for Mental Floss came about uh, in the spring of 2000. I was a student at Duke at the time, and it was during the height of the who wants to be a millionaire craze, and you guys can remember this, when Regis was on, it seemed like eight nights a week, and people would cram around their TVs and watch it, and, and we would do the same thing from our, from our dorm rooms uh, to illustrate the point that Jeremy said that we're very cool, right? That's what cool people do. They grab the dorm rooms and watch uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. So we were doing that, and the conversation came up about uh, the fact that people like to feel smart. People like to feel well-educated, but there's a block to that, and that is the fact that most people don't enjoy reading textbooks. Most, most people don't enjoy the kind of traditional format of what people consider educational materials. And we thought there's got to be some way to blur these lines or to, to come up with this blend of knowledge and entertainment. And that idea gave us, came, came about uh, as mental floss. And as I pointed to earlier, we were incredibly naive going into this. We really didn't know what made a successful newsstand product or a successful magazine at that point. So I wanted to show you the exercise that we went through. So we were launching, we, we put it out on campus in 2000 and in 2001, at the age of 21 and 22, decided that we were somehow qualified to start a nationally distributed magazine. And so, why is that funny? That part wasn't a joke. And so, we decided to go out to the newsstands. If you go to a Barnes & Noble, uh, you're frequently looking at, if you go into a major Barnes & Noble store, you're looking at about 3,000 magazines on the stands there. You probably wouldn't have guessed that high, but there are that many magazines competing for space. So I want to show you some of the magazines that were selling well. We got our hands on the newsstand figures of which ones were doing well at the time. And to show you the ex exercise we went through and how long it took us to figure out what made a successful magazine. Some of these you will recognize, some of these maybe, maybe you won't. But magazines that were out at the time, Cosmopolitan, a.k.a. Cosmo. Been around for years, your grandmother read it, your mom read it, you read it. It's been around forever. Stuff Magazine was a new launch at the time. Razor Magazine came out around that time. Shape Magazine, get your summer ready abs. Whittle your abs, thighs, and butt. We thought maybe that was the thing, but it turns out summer ready abs and whittling abs are two different things. So that wasn't the thing they had in mind. Bizarre, Harper's Bazaar, FHM. Maxim, I know I'm going quickly, I'm seeing a lot of puzzled faces, so I'll do what we did. We sat on the floor in Barnes & Noble and spread these all out in front of us. <laughs> and just stared at them. And I can remember, my guess is the other co-founder of the magazine, 
He had a coffee in his hand, he just threw it down, he said, what is it? What is it that these magazines have in common? <laughs> It took, him a, it took us about a year and a half before we finally came out with this issue. <laughs> the most frequent question asked, was actually asked by Tony backstage when I was flipping through some, some of the slides, is whose body is that? That is, in fact, Einstein's body. That's the job of the Mental Floss staff, to dive into the archives and find these things. I'm glad it's not lunchtime yet, having to look at this. So, um, had other beauties such as Pablo Picasso, Eleanor Roosevelt, Louis Armstrong. You can see why people were rushing to the newsstands to buy this magazine, right? So, in all seriousness, as we thought about this, what we were trying to create was this magazine that, again, blurred the lines between knowledge and entertainment. We saw an opportunity here to kind of poke fun at what was going on in pop culture and showing, you know, all of these swimsuit issues coming out at around the same time. We thought, you know what? Let's, let's have a little bit of fun with that and do our own version, but have some fun, interesting, or some interesting information about all of these people uh, along with it. But we really didn't know what we were doing getting into this, but we had a belief in this brand. We had a belief in this concept, and that was going to drive the way we were pursuing this. Didn't mean we didn't put together plans, but it did mean that we, we acknowledged the fact that we weren't experts in the newsstand or the magazine industry going into it. But we had an opportunity to meet with the president of the university at, at Duke at the time to explain our idea for what we were, were doing. Uh, incredibly intelligent person. And when we communicated the idea for mental floss, she said, you know, we, we explained. People are so busy, they want to learn a little bit of everything, they want to feel smarter, but they also like being entertained. So we want to create a magazine that does this, and we want to call it Mental Floss. And she thought about it for a second, and she said, you know, I think there is something to this idea. But the name is way off. The name, she said, I'm envisioning a magazine called Conversations. Yeah, Conversations. <laughs> and if you've ever been around the university president, I don't know if there are, are any here today, but uh, they always have these puppets that they can bring in that will you know, kind of agree with everything they say. So she called in one of hers, and he came in, and she explained the idea for Mental Floss, and then said, but they want to call it Mental Floss. What do you think about that? She didn't lead him at all. And he said, oh, a terrible name. Just kind of judging her, watching, see what she'd say. Bad, bad name, right? Bad, bad name. You know, I, I think it should be called Conversations. And we went against the judgment of somebody who was much more intelligent than we were and stuck with the name Mental Floss because we believed in that name. And a few years later, one of our advisory board members kind of shed some light on that moment. And he said, you know, one of the reasons that you went with it and one of the reasons this has worked to this point is because you were too naive to know what you couldn't do. You were too naive to realize there are certain rules of the newsstand industry, and if you want to release a magazine, here are the rules you follow, and if it's an education magazine, here are the rules you follow. We were going with our gut on what this should be. We were going with what we felt should be out there. It was a very, um, it was a very selfish pursuit from the beginning of saying, this is something we want to see, so we're going to go out and create it. So to show you a little bit about what Mental Floss is with that basic idea, starting with the cover. This was actually our very first cover. So we were looking around for images and ways to communicate Mental Floss. We weren't smart enough as college students to realize the name Mental should be visible, and so it looks like a dental magazine there. But this was the very first cover uh, with Einstein. And this image for us communicated what we were trying to say about this magazine, because here's one of history's greatest geniuses in a moment where he's not taking himself very seriously. And that's what we were trying to say with this. So the second cover, a spoof of Abbey Road. You've got Einstein, Stephen Hawking, Bob Dylan, and Mark Twain strolling across Abbey Road. Does anybody notice anything in common between the first two covers or the three covers you've seen to this point? Einstein. Einstein, yeah. So actually, that first cover you saw in this one, we actually didn't go into this planning to put Einstein on every cover, but some of our readers started writing in and saying, it, was, was this something you're planning to do? Is this your Alfred E. Newman or your Playboy Bunny or whatever? And we said, of course it was. And so for a long time, Einstein was there, sometimes in the background, sometimes, as you saw, more visible. Um, and so sometimes he got much more hidden over the years. We had the most powerful books in the past 25 years, and he was there. So flipping through some of those. This cover generated more reader feedback, uh, angry reader feedback, than any we've ever done from the left and the right. We try to stay pretty free of political opinion because we want to be a break from that. That was one of the important things about defining our brand for people is we wanted to be a playful brand that didn't get caught up in the kind of negative rhetoric of politics. It just wasn't what we were doing. 
But people on the left were saying, how could you dare make our, you know, our Hillary look like this? And the people on the right were saying, why did you put Hillary on there? She's never been president. When in reality, it was just as simple as the fact that when we were doing our image research, there were no fewer than 200 images of Hillary Clinton looking like she's riding a roller coaster. <laughs> so we had to go with it. We had, we had no choice. So some of our others, we do a 10 issue every year where every article or the main articles are based around the number 10. And we always like to surprise people, things you didn't realize you wanted to know, such as 10 provocative questions about chickens answered. So I didn't know, you, you may not have known, you may have wanted to know that. But that's the kind of thing that we do. And then as you get into the inside, one of the things that we were um, very thoughtful about as we put this idea together is how this brand would be communicated from the inside. I mean, it really was our belief that everything we did had to scream the brand's personality and that that's what would cause people to latch on to what we were doing. We didn't have the deep pockets to start this. We started this from summer jobs and part-time jobs to get the magazine out there after we graduated. And so it was critical to us that we put out something that would kind of find its base of evangelists when they saw what we were trying to communicate with everything. So as you go through the magazine, you'll see things, there's a column called a thousand and six words. So if a picture's worth a thousand words, we add six words to it. These drywall heads have bodies, which I didn't know before we did that article. Uh, the Kentucky Derby cheat sheet will do We'll bring people up to speed on things that are going on in the world that, of course, they've watched for years but may not know a whole lot about it. We'll give them a quick cheat sheet on the things that they should know so they'll feel just a little bit smarter. Uh, you may not remember this, but it's been 200 years since the War of 1812, so we give you a guide to throw in the War of 1812 party, right? You guys probably had that on your mind. It seems like a smart crowd, so I'm sure many of you are planning a party. So here's your guide to that to uh, vocab rehab, where we'll walk through different words from around the world and fun mnemonic devices to, to remember them. One of the key things for us early on was to realize there's a certain body of knowledge out there that people wanted to attain, certain things that people feel like they should know. And in that category falls the great works of art over the ages. And many of us would admit that if we were presented some great work of art that we'd seen many times before, a novice, including ourselves, couldn't exactly explain why this thing was so important. And so that's what we try to do with a section we call Masterpieces within the magazine, is walking people through some of those basic things. And then we do the same thing in the sciences, but communicating these things in a playful way. Some of our readers started writing in and saying, you know, we, we notice a pattern of things. And we got re you know, readers writing in saying, did you know that horses can't vomit? Did you know kangaroos can't walk? Did you know that cheetahs can't roar? These are the things our readers think about. I don't know what's wrong with them. And so we collect these things into uh, a story and flip them out. But the goal is that people should always walk away feeling a little bit smarter and with something that they want to share with somebody else. Arbitrary throwdown, who are the great builders over the years. Every time we'll, we'll take something from ancient history and compare it to something today. So who was the more prolific builder? Uh, and then we take things that people are talking about a lot in popular culture. So British television right now has been a huge thing. And we thought people want to feel more knowledgeable on this, but they don't want to admit that they really don't know how to even start. And so we did a little formula called A plus B equals BBC, where we'll take you know, two American shows and say, if you like House and you like this, you should watch this in the UK and have a lot of fun with that. And then we'll take these more playful thoughts or, or ask questions like, is Virginia really for lovers? And we'll break down the formula, very scientific, to try to see how many Marvin Gaye playings on the radio do they have, how much is their wine consumption, how many flowers are bought, how many bed and breakfasts are there. And we found out that Virginia is unfortunately not really for lovers. It's kind of middle of the road. Uh, Alaska came in at number one, and Ohio came in dead last. Nobody loves each other there. <laughs> and so what we noticed is, and, and communicating that and, and, and saying, okay, this is the idea of this brand. Mental Floss is this brand that helps knowledge junkies get their fix. It's people that want to learn more, but also don't want to be bored. They also want to be entertained. And so we recognized early on that there was an opportunity to use the magazine, which is kind of gathering the space of evangelists, and to branch out into other areas. Some were intentional from the beginning. Some, as I'll show you, were almost by accident. So we put out our first book called Condensed Knowledge uh, a number of years ago, and it was basically taking all of the areas of knowledge, saying here's a biology chapter, here's a history chapter, here's a psychology chapter, and based in list format, give people the basics of what they should have learned in school. 
With forbidden knowledge, it was kind of the opposite of that. If, if, if condensed knowledge was everything you should have learned in school but didn't, forbidden knowledge was supposed to be everything you wanted to learn, but your teacher couldn't tell you. So every chapter was based around one of the seven deadly sins. So we had a lot of fun with that. Cocktail party cheat sheets. Um, you know, it, it, these topics that people feel like they should know but don't want to admit that they don't. You know, so if you put somebody on the spot and say, you know, who was Alexander the Great or what were the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'm not really sure what kind of cocktail party that you guys are probably talking about it out there and should have read this book and now you know uh, but these are the things we do our moms always wanted us to go to med school or law school so we just created our own right so we could keep doing the magazine you know why pay $150,000 to go to Harvard when this is only 15 bucks right it comes with a diploma in both Latin and in English it's very sophisticated uh, this one comes with not only a, a, a bar exam, but a mini bar exam, because every good lawyer needs to know how to drink, right? <laughs> so the idea was to find these logical extensions of ways that we could branch out and do other things that would generate conversation around the brand. And in each stage, we didn't know what we were getting into, but we produced and we researched and we found the way to produce the product that we wanted to see. We did the same thing with a couple of history books. And then now that we've been around for 10 years, we did a uh, Mental Floss, the book of celebration of those 10 years, the greatest lists in the history of listery. Um, we did a game called Split Decision. Once again, kind of blurring those lines between education and entertainment. And uh, I'll show an example of this. Um, for a prize on the line, does anybody from their table want to try to answer a question? I'm going to read you an oddball pairing. There, there's a big prize on the line. It's a quote quiz of who said it, Mahatma Gandhi or Angelina Jolie? Who wants to take a stab? Right there. You didn't raise your hand until you heard the category. You're like, that's my thing. That's my expertise. So, all right. I believe in equality for everyone, except reporters and photographers. Gandhi or Angelina Jolie? That was actually Gandhi. I'm going to give you one more try, right? To win the prize. Without pain, there would be no suffering. Without suffering, we would never learn from our mistakes. Angelina Jolie, all right, round of applause. I got more game over here for you. So we wanted to come up with something. It was very important that we connect with that audience. It's not just a matter of coming up with, uh, with ideas that you know, would teach people, but having them engage in them. And so, uh, actually, I'll talk about this for just a second. I forgot to put this slide in here. We decided to move into the children's category as well. Um, and there's been you know, educational products out there for years for children, and we wanted to take the mental floss personality into the children's market as well. And so we're launching a line with a company called Melissa and Doug that you guys may have heard of if you have children uh, later this year, and it should be a lot of fun. And uh, so what we've decided to do from there was we recognized we were getting these letters from readers, we were hearing from them very regularly, and we, we recognized there was an opportunity to build this community. Well, you can't do it as easily through print, and so we started doing this online through our website of publishing daily posts, quizzes, very interactive things. We did this quiz, this has been years ago, nobody knows what MySpace is anymore, where we started doing these quizzes uh, that much like Split Decision, I'll give you a name, is this a discontinued Ben & Jerry's flavor or the name of a band we found on MySpace? <laughs> we actually got a letter from the PR department of Ben & Jerry's that, that Jerry of Ben & Jerry's had taken the quiz and only gotten 8 out of 10 correct. And <laughs> we were fortunately right and avoided the lawsuit. Here was a way to engage our readers to actually have them participate in what we were doing. This was our first experiment with uh, kind of user-generated content. And so we knew we were trying to find a way to do that, and so we created something called the Amazing Fact Generator, where readers can actually submit facts that they learn. We filter them, make sure they're accurate, make sure they're interesting, and then if a reader did submit them, you would see their name and where they're from on there. And so our readers really got engaged in this. This has been served up over 100 million times over the last few years, so it's really something that's, that's taken off. Uh, we answered very important questions like, what legal authority does Judge Judy have? I know you've all wondered that. So hard hitting things like that, and why does your nose get stuffy one nostril at a time? Things you probably wondered walking in here today. Uh, and these things become very social and very, very, uh, you know, shareable is what we try to, to make them. We do lots of lists that people like to share. And so as we go online, our thinking was, how do we create lists? How do we create things that people then want to talk about? Because if we don't have a huge promotional budget, how do we get them engaged in this in a way that leads them to want to do the advertising for us? And so that's what we've tried to do over the years with the website. We started doing these things where it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek worksheet idea 
that you'd pass them around at your office. You'd actually print this out, you'd complete a worksheet, and then you'd post it up on your cubicle or something. It was, you know, obviously tongue in cheek. We did this one around St. Patrick's Day, and we'd read you a fact if it was about uh, St. Patrick, you'd circle the clover. If it was about uh, Samuel L. Jackson, you'd circle the Royale with cheese. So, that's a very challenging quiz. We had an opportunity, you won't be able to see this next slide that well, but an opportunity to go out to Mountain View, California to speak to the employees at Google. And uh, we'd heard about how smart they were, and we thought, we've got to come up with some way to engage them and really put them to the test. So we came up with what we call the world's geekiest crossword puzzle. It wasn't just challenging, every answer was actually in a constructed language, like Klingon or Elvish or Esperanto. <laughs> I'm not an expert on these, but believe it or not, there are experts on these. And we said, everybody who answers these, uh, this whole thing correctly will win a free board game and a book and a subscription and came up with these big package ideas thinking, you know, maybe one guy will be able to complete half of it. So no fewer than 25 people came to us with completed crossword puzzles. <laughs> Not only that, they were correcting our grammatical mistakes and cling on. <laughs> Very offensive. <laughs> So what has generated over the years is the chatter around that and the way that we've found kind of a viral quality to these things. And so we're, we're using, uh, you know, kind of celebrities have helped spread the word. We saw mental floss on the red carpet uh, a few weeks ago. One of our readers tipped us off to this. And the most proud moment in the last year or so was actually seeing for the first time, people love to show off that they're reading The New Yorker, but this time, this smart guy actually has mental floss on top of The New Yorker, which is something we rarely see. And the chatter around this, uh, whether it's Alyssa Milano or Alton Brown, who will start writing a, copy, a, a column for us very soon. We rely on these kind of creative ways to spread the word uh, around what we're doing. And so Twitter is a very, very important thing uh, for us. We have almost a couple hundred thousand uh, followers on Twitter. And it's been a very, very organic thing. We don't pay to get those. We don't you know, do any huge promotions. It's just something that's built over time and helps us spread the word about the brand. But if, I, if there's one thing that we've done that I think has helped set us apart from the other kind of smart magazines out there or educational magazines out there or fault leading magazines, whatever you'd want to call these, is that we recognized very early on that our readers were smarter than we were. And we wanted to give them a platform. We wanted to give them an opportunity to show that off. And we really saw this back in 2006 when Pluto was devoted from the list of planets. Now, I hope everybody knew that. I, someone broke into tears at a re recent speaking engagement that had not heard that. But one of our readers wrote in and said, we should mourn the loss of Pluto together by doing a shirt that says, Pluto, RIP, revolve in peace. <laughs> just to show how nerdy our readers are, this thing flew off the shelves. We never made a t-shirt before. We just said, let's put it out there, put it on online, and see if people buy it. And people did, and so we said, wow, that was great. Why don't we pay you guys if you give us ideas that we end up using? And so that ended up happening where uh, readers started submitting ideas for t-shirts. So you can see, when life gives you scurvy, make lemonade. <laughs> there's no right way to eat a Reese's, <laughs> which there's really not. Archaeologists will date any old things. All the readers, these are all coming from our readers. Natural selection, good things come to those who made. Vinny Vinny Wiki, I came, I saw, I edited collaboratively. <laughs> Very nice message. There. Spork, the other white utensil playing. We haven't been sued by the pork industry yet for this play on there. I'm an English major, you do the math. St. <laughs> Louis, the home of giant croquet. <laughs> My grandmother saw this and she was like, is that what that's about? So, uh, and then sometimes we'll get letters from readers that end up being t-shirt ideas, and I don't know if they intended them to or not. This one wasn't one of the ancient birds. <laughs> Uh, we got a, a letter from a reader that said, Dear Editor, I'm no rocket surgeon, but... I don't know if they were joking or not, but we mailed them a check for 125 bucks and turned it into a t-shirt. So sometimes our readers are accidentally smarter than we are. And so, uh, so what we recognized very early is that they were giving us ideas and they were participating in this in, this in a way that we could kind of elevate the presence of the brand without having to spend a fortune to do that. Obviously not every brand or every company lends itself to that, but in discovering that this was one of those brands, we created a community so that we may have a magazine that's the backbone, but whenever we put out a new board game, whenever we put out a children's product, whenever we put out a new, you know, whatever it may be, those readers are the first to know about it, and those readers are the ones to become evangelists to talk about it.
And so creating evangelists out of our customers, out of our readers, in a non-abusive way, but in an inclusive way, uh, has been key to our success over the years. They come up with other ideas they send us. So they, uh, one of our readers said, I've got two kids in college, I'd love to be able to send them a care package. Mental Floss, can you create a care package for my children? We thought, well, if we're going to do this, we might as well do it right. And so we have these pizza boxes, and they can send these special deliveries with Smarties candy and nerds and Think Gum. I actually had this shirt on in an airport not too long ago, spell check right there. And a man walked up to me, he was probably 70 or 80 years old, and he poked me right in the chest and he said, Chex Mix. And then he walked off. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it was an important point to him. And he made it. And he, it, this is how the Metal Floss connects people in a very physical way. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, and so they come up with these ideas and then as I showed you, split decisions. So from the very beginning, we recognized we didn't know exactly what we were getting into. But we knew there was an idea out there. We knew that people wanted to feel smarter. We knew that people liked to be entertained. And we were willing to try to create a vehicle and an engagement factor that, that, that got our readers involved in this to help us kind of plot the way uh, as we grow and as, as, as we've you know, grown the company over the years. And it's gone well for us. And we're excited to see what the next 10 years may bring. As Jeremy mentioned, we were acquired about, uh, about a year ago. Uh, by a man by the name of Felix Dennis, who was funny showing those slides and making fun of Maxim at that point. He actually launched Maxim in the States uh, about a decade ago and a number of other magazines, but The Week is his other main publication here. And it's been a great partnership because he's very entrepreneurial, and so we're looking to invest in other ways that we can continue to grow the company. But uh, I see I have seven seconds left, and so I'm going to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, yeah. and then say thank you. <laughs> If you don't subscribe to Metal Floss Magazine, you should. That's my shameless plug for it. It comes every other month, and it's hilarious. Some of the things are shocking. Some of the things are surprising. But you never really know what you're going to get. So I highly recommend it.